birds to respond to uh, vocalization of their own kind. So if you wanted to sample uh, great horned owls and you had a vocalization of a great horned owl, you could go out and broadcast this and you're listening for a response. And, and, th and they do this a lot with marsh birds too in the daytime because marsh birds are really secretive. You're not going to see that sore rail and you're not going to see that king rail and you know, you just don't. But if you broadcast a call, they respond. And then you're like, huh, yeah, there's a store rail on this body of water. Check. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. So that, they're appropriate for, for certain instruments. So it's, there's a lot of ways to go at things, and it all comes back to what is your question, and what do I know about this animal, this bird, um, that helps me decide what's the best way to go at this. So I'm going to work through a case study with flammulated owls because they had some very unique life history characteristics that help you figure out what's the best way of getting information about them. So a flammulated owl, as I mentioned before, is nocturnal. It's a migratory species, so it's not here all the time. When it is here during the breeding season, the males readily respond to a broadcast call. And it occurs in a certain kind of habitat, so that limits where I need to go. What else is that? Oh, yeah, so it's territorial. So that's why it's responding to the broadcast call. So if, if the question was, we want to know if we have flammulated owls on this part of the Payette National Forest, we would start out by saying, OK, well, where's the habitat on the Payette National Forest? And where's the habitat that I can get to? on the Payette National Forest. And then we go from there and just decide what we're going to serve it. So you, you ask, first of all, what is it you want to know? What's your question? Because there could be lots of questions, and you might go out in different ways. You know, where am I going to do it? When am I going to do it? Am I going after every individual or not? How am I going to design my survey? All of these kinds of things come into play. So for the question, it was, where do they occur in the payout forest? So the first thing we did was create a layer of habitat based on their information on timber on the payout forest. So we want to be in Ponderosa Pine. We don't want to be in subalpine fir. We don't want to be in the alpine zone. They are tied to Ponderosa Pine Forest. They're nocturnal. They like big trees because they feed on moths, and they need space in the canopy to fly around and get those moths. So, okay, we're limiting, we're cutting down the scope of where we need to be. Because they're nocturnal, it's probably not safe for us to be tripping through the woods at night, right? Trying to go after them. So, we're probably going to limit our, where we go, to roads and maybe major trails for safety. Okay, so now we have an even better way of narrowing down where we're going to go. We know that the males respond to these calls. We're going to use a broadcast survey. We're going to have a tape. We're going to establish a protocol of, we're going to have points along the road. How far apart should those points be? Well, we don't want to broadcast the call here and get an owl and then only move, you know, 100 yards and broadcast again because we're going to get the same owl, right? We want to go far enough away so we're getting a different group of individuals if we can. So we have, we decide, not our points are going to be 500 meters apart along the road. We're going to do it at night. We're going to stop and at that point we're going to stay for 10 minutes. And we're going to have a whole protocol of listening, broadcast, listening, broadcast, listening, back and forth, back and forth, you know, these sort of stuff. And we're going to start at 5 in the evening in the summer, in June. Yeah, you want to be dark. So you're starting at 10 o'clock. <laughs> and you go going all night long. Only you're really not. You have a transect because they quiet down. Just like in the daytime with birds, there's this midday lull. Same thing with nocturnal calling birds. They're, gonna, they're not going to be calling straight all night long. They're going to start calling, and then there's going to be this lull. So you focus on it right after dark when they're going to be calling. 
So you arrange your whole thing around what you know about this bird. Then you decide, eh, if it's snowing, it's probably not a good idea to be out there because that's gonna, that's gonna bias my account if I have some days that are snowing and some that are snowing. All these things you work through. What do I need for equipment, right? Probably need my little collar, the thing that broadcasts the call. I need the right call. What if there's more than one call that they make, which they do? Flamily, I'll make two calls. Okay, I better have both of those on my tape. And I'm going to actually keep track of which one I hear back according to which one I play. And then you can get really crazy with all the data you're collecting, and all sorts of associations. You want a thermometer, maybe you want a wing measure, you need a clipboard, you need some pencils, you need a data form. Maybe you need a partner. If you work for the Forest Service, they'll definitely send you with a partner. If you work for Fishing Game, we don't care. You can <laughs> <laughs> we don't have all these rules about safety. <laughs> Maybe you got this huge block of beautiful habitat in the Frank Church wilderness. And so yeah, it's worth it for me to fly in there and backpack and set up camp and scout my trail. There happens to be a trail to it. And yeah, I can fit 10 census points through this habitat, and you bet I'm going to do that, because that's really fun. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we do it that way too. So these are all the things you have to think about when, when you're designing a service. So this was our plan at all. I, we decided nocturnal play barks during the breeding season, when they hear, when the males are vocal, calling stations, 10 minute broadcasts, which my technician Pam Bond used to be my technician using our little, that was what our broadcast collar looked like back then. It looked like a big flashlight. Easy, lightweight, easy to carry around in the woods, and, and when we actually hit the backpack in. That's a picture of kind of what the habitat might look like. Okay, so we're, we're, we're rounding down. You're, we're gonna do an exercise where you guys are gonna design a survey. You're gonna work in like groups. You're gonna design something, okay? But just before I finish, I just want a few things, my bugaboos. So if there's more than one Canada goose, it doesn't become Canadian geese, <laughs> right? Canadian is not plural for Canada. So it's always Canada geese and Canada goose. Now make sure if you're around me, <laughs> do you say that because it just makes me crazy. <laughs> If you feed hummingbirds, yes, they are attracted to the color red. No, the nectar does not have to be red. And in fact, it's bad if it is, because that's dye, and that's a toxin. And you never, ever use honey to mix your nectar. It's always just plain white death sugar. Maybe you could get organic, you know, like natural sugar or something, but not honey. And water, it's a really simple formula, four to one. Boil it, let it cool, stick it in your feeder. That's all you need to do. But you should change it in the heat of the summer, like every three or four days, because it starts to ferment, okay? So even if you don't, like, uh, so my solution to that is to not get one of those humongous hummingbird feeders unless you've got 20 hum hummingbirds visiting your feeder. They're never gonna go through that. I have two, maybe three pairs of hummingbirds around my house. So. I have a skinny little feeder that forces me to refill it every day because they might empty that in two days. And so it makes me make fresh nectar. And if you're feeding birds in the winter, we had this discussion about this at our break, lots of disease transmits through birds at bird feeders. So you really technically should be through the course of the winter pulling in your feeders and washing them in a bleach and water solution and then rinsing them really well, get rid of the bleach and letting them air dry and then putting them back out. I don't do that in the winter, but I do it, I don't feed in the summer and I do it at the end of every season. And I have feeders that don't allow the birds to be standing in the feed, which is the biggest problem with them pooping and standing around in the, in the bird feed. So just something to be aware of. Okay, and if you want some resources, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is probably the best place to go when you're, when you're just general question about birds. They have awesome bird ID stuff. They have 
They're the ones that have all the citizen science programs like um, the Backyard Feeder Watch. They have eBird, which is the electronic online report all your sightings in eBird. You can have your own little eBird account. If you want to keep track of your personal birding history, you can do that on eBird, but it allows them to access the data as well. So it's, it's fun to just be involved in something bigger that way. <coughs> um, if, you, if you want to get into watching birds, a good introduction is to do that one weekend in February, the Backyard Feeder Watch, because it's only for a two-day period, and, and you're, you don't have to go anywhere. And it really challenges you to keep track of what you're actually seeing, because it's not as simple as it seems. I mean, how many, you don't just count everything. Oh, there's black, black cap chicken. Count that. Oh, there's another one. Count that. How do you know they're the, not the same bird? You actually, what they're trying to get at is how many individuals do you have, not just how many times you see a black cap chicken. Black cap chicken. So, it tests your observation skills, and so you know, I'd say that's a good way to, to jump in. Um, any other questions you have about birds? I'm happy to try to answer them. General questions like, "What is this bird?" or anything else. You can we can talk about it now after we do this exercise. You can call me up, whatever. Thanks, Sally. Have fun, Sally. <coughs> no problem. We hit you, Sally. Yeah. I have a few. Um, I have a checklist to the Birds of Valley County. Um, that's fun. It has, so we'll pass that out for you. Um, I have, I'm giving away things from Migratory Bird Day. So this is a bookmark. I don't even know what they say. <laughs> but <laughs> that might be something useful. So what, what's our time? What do we have left for time? It's about 1130. Oh, wow. OK, we're going to go fast. So what I'd like you to do is maybe split up into three groups or so and do this exercise of designing a survey. And I've already posed a question, but you don't have to do it on this question. If you have another question you'd like to design a survey around, feel free to create a new question and then work through answering what time of year should we do this? Where is it going to be? Which method? You know, all those things we just talked about with Flamula et al. I'd like to see where you guys go with this. It's nothing that we're going to, you know, it's nothing performance based or anything like that. I'm just curious um, to see where you might take it. So maybe just split up. You can split yourselves up into three groups or so. Everyone grab a piece of paper. Oh. All right, these are awfully big groups. That's okay. <laughs> you guys want a different group back there? Yeah. 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 Okay. I'll come around. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. Maybe take 15 minutes and just see. All right, you and I will be in a group. Okay. What is the question? So that's the question.
want to say, you know, we want to stay away from that. So we want to say something like this. Okay. 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 Okay.
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would probably